Hello everyone, I'm June and today I want to talk to you about graduate school, specifically about the process of applying to graduate school and I'm also going to answer some questions that I have been getting since I started this journey. Now please know that I said the process of applying to graduate school, not the process of getting into graduate school. They are two different things and I have no insider information whatsoever on actually getting in. I'm going to make a disclaimer right here. I am not an expert. I have never served on an admissions committee. I am just someone who's been through this uh, process before once or twice and what I'm about to share with you is purely based on my experience and the experience of other people that I know who have also been through this process. With that out of the way, I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope that it is helpful. The first thing that you need to do after you decide that you want to go to graduate school is carefully select the schools that you want to apply to. Perhaps the most important aspect of choosing a school is fit. And when I say fit, what I mean is how is this particular program in that school going to help you where you want to go and vice versa what do you have to bring to that program for example if you're interested in early american history then you need to find a program or a group of programs that are strong in early american history now that doesn't mean that they can't be strong in other fields but they have to be strong in the field that you want to be in so once you have chosen your schools you need to look at the requirements they usually all require just about the same they all require that you take the gre the gre is a standardized exam that has three parts one is a math part, one is a verbal part, and another one is a written part. Now, the GRE is not specific to the humanities. It is uh, the same exam whether you're going into STEM or whatever other field you're going into. And it's actually a pretty expensive exam. Not only expensive to take, but also expensive to prepare for. Some people take courses, and sometimes they can be in the thousands of dollars, or you can buy a book and you can study from that, and that's what I did. The fee for the exam when I took it was $199, and that was for the computerized exam. They also have a paper exam that is available in some areas, and I believe in foreign countries, um, especially third world countries, you can take it in uh, paper form. But in the US, you most likely don't have a choice and you have to do the computerized exam. I concentrated on the comprehensive and the written portion because that is what matters the most in my field. The next component of your application and one of the most important ones are your letters of recommendation. Now for these letters, which are usually about three, depends on the school as everything, but about three, you want to pick professors who know you well as a student. You don't want to ask some random professor whose class you took in your freshman year and it was a lower division course and he doesn't know you because he hasn't seen you since, right? You have to find someone who knows you well as a student and ideally well as a human because these are people who are already in your field who are vouching for you. They are saying to the missions committees, hey, this person's good enough to become one of us. And if the person who's writing your letter doesn't really know you, it shows in the letter. Now, this is easier said than done because you have to think about this ahead of time because you really need to foster this kind of relationship with either your advisor or your professor who supervises your undergraduate thesis if, if that's what you're doing, but you need to find someone who knows you well and you know it has to be someone who can speak well of you. The next part of the application and also extremely important right up there with your letters of recommendation is a writing sample. All schools require a writing sample, and this is for a very good reason, actually a few good reasons. One, it tells the admissions committee that you can write well enough at the college level, and that with a little grooming you can write well enough at the PhD level. It tells the committee that you can take sources and think critically and make arguments and support them with evidence. Um, so it is, it is crucial that you have a very strong writing sample. What most people do is that they use either their master thesis if they have done a master's degree or they use a seminar paper from when they were undergraduates. What I don't recommend is that you write a paper specifically for this unless you have one or two professors who can actually look at it and read it because if you don't do that then how do you know that you wrote a good enough paper? In my case I used the paper that I wrote for one of my classes when I was in, in college still. Now, I didn't go to college that long ago, even though I'm a little older, but I used a paper that had been looked at by several professors and over the couple of years that I was thinking about applying to graduate school, I worked on it and got it revised again. So I felt that my writing sample was strong enough. I did not want to risk writing something from scratch. Another requirement for most schools is a statement of purpose, sometimes called a personal statement. It is not the story of your life. It is a piece of writing where you tell the committee 
why you want to join the program, why that program specifically, what do you want to study, what do you want to research, why do you want to go to graduate school. Now keep in mind that you are only starting or hoping to start graduate school so you're not gonna have all your ducks in a row but you have to have a pretty good idea of why you want to be there otherwise you're not telling yourself and that is what the statement of purpose and everything else in your application is trying to do is trying to sell yourself to the school that you want to go to some schools also require a CV, some don't and if you don't know what that is, it's sort of like a resume but it's a little different if you don't have one and you really need one because your school requires it then I would recommend that you go to someone who knows how to write one because they're a little different like I said from resumes and you're gonna need one down the road anyway so you might as well learn how to do it now finally once you have gathered all your documents you have people who have agreed to write letters of recommendation for you you've taken your exams and everything else you actually apply this is the easiest step of the whole process you just go to the school's website, you log in through their portal, and you fill it out, and you submit it. Schools have an application fee, and this is where I'm going to tell you that applying to graduate school is expensive. So I'm gonna give you a ballpark idea. I applied to 10 schools. Between the GRE, the school application fees, and the transcripts, I spent approximately $1,250, and that includes one waiver. I got a fee waiver from one school. And that's something you may want to look into, not all schools do it, but some do. And the waiver usually has to do with your military status. Um, it has nothing to do with need, as far as I can tell. So you want to check into that, but it is very expensive. And this is not even counting what you did to get ready for the GRE or um, any other kind of prep that you did for anything else. So it is expensive, which also limits the amount of schools to which you can apply. Uh, some people can't apply to 10, some people can only do 2 or 3. In that case, you just have to hope for the best. So after you fill out the application and submit it, the really hard part begins. This is the hard part because this is when you wait. And you wait, and you wait, and then you wait some more. It is a nightmare <laughs> waiting. It is difficult because everything that you could possibly do up to this point, you have done. The rest is out of your hands. It is out of your hands entirely and there's nothing you can do about it. To give you an idea of how long it actually takes for schools to get back to you, uh, my last application was submitted on the 16th of December and I didn't hear anything from any schools until the middle of February. And the last school that I heard from uh, got back to me on April 14th. April 14th is the last day that you as a student have to either decline or accept an admissions offer. So you can imagine that a school that had a deadline of December 1st didn't actually get back to me until the middle of April. And that is a long time when you are waiting for something that will change your life. It is a long time. By the middle of January, I was already a wreck. I was a lunatic. I was checking my email every time my phone beeped. I was looking at the portals, I was looking at everything. So how do you hear from schools? Again, it depends on the school, depends on who your advisor is going to be, but you will either hear on the phone, they will call you and tell you, you know, you got in, or you will hear by email or through the portal. Now the longer you wait to hear from a school, the more likely it is that you did not get in. They will not actually call you if you didn't get in, for the most part. They'll only call you if they have good news to give you. So yeah, if you have not heard from a school by, by April, I would say chances are you probably didn't get in. And I know because I did not get into a lot of places. I got into some and I was very lucky to get into my top choices, but not everyone is that lucky. And that is something else that you need to be very conscious of when you're going into this process that you will apply and you will pour your everything into this, these applications and you may not get in anywhere at all and it is not uncommon and it has nothing to do with you it, I mean it could be a million things as to why you didn't get in and it's not personal those people don't know you, they don't know who you are, they're not picking on you they just have a lot of competitive applicants and they have to choose the best and there is really no point in driving yourself crazy trying to find out why you didn't get into X, Y or Z school because it's, it's just it's a crapshoot. It is really truly is a crapshoot and you have no way of predicting. So yes, be ready for failure and if you succeed then well hey happy you and if you don't succeed you may try again next year. Some people do. I don't think I could have done it because of the expense and the emotional drain 
but some people do it some people try year and year and year again until they get in or until they decide that it's just not worth it at that point now, if you are lucky enough to get into more than one school then choosing one of them can also be very difficult because if they are both schools that you really want to go to they are both schools that are high in your rankings on your own personal rankings uh, and you have to choose one and you will question your entire life up to that point you will question your choice over and over again after you make it and you just have to make one you have to make a choice and stick with it and it is normal everyone that i've spoken to that have gone through this have experienced the same thing and at that point once you have chosen a school and declined the others there's really nothing else you can do at this point you just have to soldier on and go to graduate school and now to the questions the number one question that i get from people when they find out that i'm going to graduate school is how are you going to pay for it at such a fancy school well i'm not and this is why and i'm actually surprised that this isn't common knowledge but when you do a phd in a research-based program they usually pay you to go there now it's not the same for professional school so if you go to dental school medical school law school what have you you pay to be there but in these other instances, the school pays you. Not only do they pay you a stipend, but they also waive your tuition and a lot of times they'll pay for your health insurance. So I am not paying to go to grad school. Grad school is paying me to go there. Yeah, that is a pretty sweet deal. One of the other questions that I get a lot is, aren't you a little old to go to grad school? Well, no, I'm not. First of all, demographics are changing so much in college campuses that the average age of a student today is not anywhere near what it was, say, 20 years ago. So while, yes, college is usually full of younger kids, graduate school is not. Um, I am not a spring chicken. I have plenty of gray in my hair, but I'm not that old either. And I'm not actually the oldest, I don't think, in my cohort either. There is at least one other person who is older. If he accepted, I don't know if he accepted. But the point is that, no, I am not old. Um, I should say I'm not too old to go to grad school. Another question that I get quite often is why do you want to go to graduate school? Now this is a very good question and it is a fair one. It is one that I've asked myself and it is one that I had to explain to an admissions committee. So I know the answer to this. I had a job that was quite a nice job, you know, 9 to 5 office job, great pay, great benefits, but it wasn't what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I have always wanted to be a historian, so this is why I'm doing it. Now, I have talked about this in my blog, but not in videos. I started college as a biomedical engineering major, and I hated it. I hated it so much that in my junior year, I switched to history, and the rest, as they say, is history. Now, I don't regret that switch for a minute. Yes, it is true that if I had become an engineer, I would have made a lot more money, but yes, I would have hated it, because if I hated it as a student, I would have probably hated it as an employee of the industry as well. So I'm going to graduate school for history because it is what I've always wanted to do and it was time to do something that I wanted to do. Another question that I get is, are you going to work while you go to graduate school? No, I'm not going to work. And there are two reasons for this. The first reason is that my funding, I'm on a fellowship, which is kind of like a scholarship, does not allow me to work they require that i go to class and that's it right so basically they want me and all the other students who get this fellowship at my school they want us to concentrate on getting a phd and doing outside work can be a little distracting and quite frankly doing a phd is a full-time job it is very difficult classes are um, involved there's a lot of reading a lot of writing and it's a full-time job so what i'm going to do is whatever time i would have spent in a job I'm going to spend reading and writing and doing stuff for class. So that's what I'm going to do. Another question that I get often is how does a PhD actually work? Well, this depends on the country you're in. In the United States, they are usually between five and seven years. Some people take longer, some people do it in less time, but thereabouts. The first two years of any PhD program are coursework years. So basically you go to class and you take all the required courses. And in the spring of your second year, you take um, your comprehensive examinations and these examinations vary by field but they are supposed to test your knowledge in your primary field and your secondary field and sometimes even a third field and after that you become what is called an ABD is all but dissertation and you are a PhD candidate not a PhD student so after the first two years 
you start doing your research and then you write your dissertation. That's what you do until you're done. At that point, you, in my school at least, you can teach if you want to teach for experience, which I plan to do because you know I have to be able to prove to, um, to schools later on where I'm trying to get a job that I can teach. But after that is basically research and writing. So more reading and writing, like the first two years, but different. And the last question I'm going to answer, but by no means the last question I get, is what do you want to do with that degree? So there are two answers to that. The first one is that yes, when you are working on a PhD in the humanities, and I can only speak for the humanities, that they groom you to teach. They groom you to be a college professor who will eventually get a tenure track position at some university or what have you. So yes, um, the, ideally I will be teaching. That said, I am not opposed to careers in public history, like museum work, archives, or anything of the sort. I am leaving my career choices open because the state of academia currently is not pretty and finding tenure track positions is difficult. So if you go in with the mindset that you want to be a college professor and a college professor only, you may be setting yourself up for some heartache later on down the line. I hope that was helpful and if you have any other questions about applying to grad school or anything that I've talked about here today, please ask in the comments and I will see if I can get back to you. But I hope you subscribe and stick around and like it if you like it.